a little bit of insight into uh, performance nutrition and hopefully a lot of takeaways, practical takeaways, because I know it can be extremely frustrating for athletes when uh, they get told a lot of theoretical uh, sort of hyperbole about um, about nutrition. So the aim for today is to definitely give you a lot of practical takeaways. Just get rid of this if I can. Okay, uh, sorry, technical issues. Can you say the names of the people on top of the screen? You can, okay. If I can, don't know why that is coming up. Hmm. Sorry about that. Okay. Um, why is that doing that? Apologies. Does anyone know how to get rid of that? I've never had that happen before. The uh, Who We Are page with just yourself. What's that? Yeah, I, don't, I don't think. Uh, I don't think we can see what you're seeing. Oh, you can't. Okay, perfect. So That's we, all we right. We can see your slide. It works just as so long as you can perfect. read it somewhere. It's working just fine for us. Perfect. Sorry about that. Okay. My name is Scott Tindall. I'm one of the co-founders of Fuel In. Fuel In is the world's first uh, training-based nutrition app that syncs directly with Training Peaks, Today's Plan, and Final Surge. Uh, my background, I'm Australian. I did live overseas for the better part of 20 years, uh, working uh, in a lot of different professional sports, uh, including professional rugby, professional cricket, professional sailing with the America's Cup, and with uh, the National Hockey League or the NHL with the Toronto Maple Leafs. And then finally, since 2017, been working with Ironman and was part or am part of the Nutrition Advisory Board for Ironman. Um, throughout sort of the past, I guess, five, six years, I've worked with a number of professional triathletes and then have worked with many, many age group athletes from the weekend warrior to the up and coming or the aspiring sort of professional or very professional age group. Uh, um, I'll detail more about fuel, to, fuel in later, but just wanted to give you a little bit of background. Elizabeth Impen won't be joining us today, but she is uh, one of the other nutrition coaches. And I can also announce that uh, Dr. Alan McCubbin from Monash University is joining as a sports dietitian, a, a registered sports dietitian, um, which is fantastic news for us. And he'll be a massive asset to uh, the team. For those of you who do know Alan, he is a researcher in sweat uh, and hydration extremes at temperatures with endurance athletes and has a wealth of experience. Okay, so uh, what we're gonna to cover today is the top triathlon mistakes. We're gonna talk about carbohydrates. We'll talk about hydration and then get into any questions that you may have. Okay, so when we, when we talk about the top six nutrition mistakes that triathletes will make um, I think the first thing that we can safely say is that more often than not we see that athletes do not establish baselines now these baselines can be a number of factors but if you don't establish a baseline you never know where you're actually going so if, if we're thinking about baselines something a baseline that often gets brought up is athletes will say look I think I need to lose weight in order to achieve my race weight now without having a good understanding of body composition that's a really difficult question to answer. So something that we would recommend is that most athletes get what's called a DEXA, a dual X-ray absorbometry, okay? So this will give you an accurate measure of body composition from subcutaneous fat through to visceral fat, the fat in and around your organs. Uh, it will also give you a measure of your lean muscle mass, and it will also give you a measure of your bone mineral density. Now, if we, the important part there is about the bone mineral density as well. Bone mineral density in Australia is not examined until you're at least 70 years of age. Now, by that stage, if you are osteopenic, which is low bone mineral density or osteoporotic, it's probably going to be too late to do anything about it. I can tell you from experience and also from the research that there is a fairly moderate to high percentage of athletes, especially cyclists and swimmers with low bone mineral density, and it happens to triathletes as well. Anecdotally, speaking from experience, we've seen probably up to 20, 25% of athletes um, have low bone mineral density, okay? So if your T is not greater than minus one, then you potentially, well, you are at risk of low bone mineral density and therefore at increased risk of uh, stress fractures in particular. 
The other baselines you might want to consider getting is things like blood tests. A lot of athletes will be trying to improve their nutrition, uh, but not necessarily understanding in the particular areas where you want to go. So blood tests, again, the full panel uh, would be something that we would recommend, but certainly something like your iron panel, your full iron panel, including hemoglobin, ferritin, and your transferrin saturation is going to give you a very clear understanding if you're iron deficient or iron deficient anemic or um, iron, iron deficient non-anemia. Uh, and this particular um, issue or pathology that uh, we have encountered and uh, a fairly high percentage of, again, endurance athletes will encounter this. Around 35% of female athletes uh, have been diagnosed in the literature as having uh, iron deficiency and around 15% of males. So it's not a female only, but it's certainly something that you want to consider. Uh, other, other things that you might want to get tested, uh, things from uh, vitamin D would be another one. Even though we live in Australia, it is surprising or not really that surprising given how much the slip, slop, slap can campaign and also living indoors or working indoors during COVID that a lot of athletes will be vitamin D deficient. Um, you can look on our YouTube channel for um, a couple of talks around vitamin D and its importance. Other factors could be things related to your health, including, say, your lipid profile, your blood sugar control, so your HbA1c. The other baselines that we then go into is things like your carbohydrate intake and your sweat rate. So if you don't have a good understanding of what your carbohydrate intake is or your ability to take on large amounts of carbohydrates, then it makes it very difficult to plan out 0.6 having a race day. So if, you're, if you do not know how many grams per hour you can consume on the bike and on the run at differing temperatures, at differing intensities, then you can't manage your nutrition appropriately. And that's the same with 0.3, the lack of sweat rate data. So do you understand how much you sweat on the bike, how much you sweat on the run, at what temperatures, how does that affect your sweat rate? And then what is your optimal fluid intake? And again, without measuring that and without getting consistent data, you can't actually honestly say that you have a good understanding of your sweat, uh, your hydration plan. And point number four is a really interesting one for us because I think there's been so much uh, talk of low carb, high fat diets in the past five years. And then certainly in the last 12 to 18 months, there's certainly been a renaissance of uh, carbohydrates due to the Nor Norwegians. Um, it's still not a single macro is going to make you invincible. Okay, So whether you're a believer in higher carbohydrates for uh, racing or whether you're a fan of low carbohydrate, high fat, um, it's not going to be one or the other. It should be context specific, uh, mostly related to the duration of the training sessions and then also the intensity but you still need to also focus on protein. And protein is one of those, uh, protein is one of those macronutrients that certainly is of utmost importance to uh, endurance athletes. And usually what we see is that endurance athletes are taking on far too little protein. In terms of uh, the other mistake that we see is probably not eating enough. Uh, I think athletes will tend to, uh, certainly cyclists, and we've seen this in the past, is that athletes will tend to uh, go into very long training sessions and have this badge of honor that eating is cheating. And that's simply not the case. And if you really want to actually dial in your nutrition, having uh, your nutrition dialed in around training sessions and then appropriately fueling is going to be a much more effective way of managing uh, your um, managing your body composition, but also managing your daily fueling needs. Okay. And then point number six being not having a race day, a race day plan. Now, really, points one, two, three, four, and five are all going to play into point number six, okay? If you've got those baselines, then you can effectively understand what you're going to have to do on race day. There we go. Okay. So... If we go into sweat rate testing, as I said, uh, the screen on the right is a screen from Fuel In, and what we're doing here is providing you with guard rails. Just got a problem in the house. <laughs> um, what we're doing is providing you with guard rails. So effectively, we're never going to say to you that 
you can only consume 1.2 liters of fighting range. And it's usually going to be around 60 to 70% of whatever uh, your, your fluid loss is, okay? So we need to know the temperature range in terms of is it less than 30 degrees Celsius or over 30 degrees Celsius, give or take. Obviously, if you're, if you're training in 28 degrees, you'd probably log it as a hot session. The duration of the session becomes important. The type of session, whether it's a brick, a run, uh, or a bike session, and then understanding things like your fluid loss, fluid intake, your percentage of body weight loss, your thirst rating, any GI complaints, and then also the amount of sodium you're taking in. One common thing that we often see is that athletes will tend to take in a set amount of sodium in milligrams per hour. And the impact of that is that you, if you're taking in less and less fluid as you continue through the day, you can imagine if you're taking in 500, uh, 500 milligrams of sodium per hour and you're taking in a liter at the start, that is effectively 500 milligrams per liter you're consuming. However, if that fluid intake starts to drop as you continue through exercise and suddenly by the end, you're only consuming 500 mils per hour, well then that 500 milligrams has now doubled. And so you're effectively, or relatively speaking, taking in a thousand milligrams per hour. And that could become problematic down the line if you continue to do that and effectively pour uh, more and more sodium into a bucket that's got a hole in it. The important point about all of this sweat rate testing is that you need to be your own scientist, okay? So you need to be collecting as much data as possible. And when we talk about sweat, sweat rate testing, I should say, this is simply, just getting on a set of scales before and after a session, okay? So you're weighing yourself before that session, ideally naked or in a pair of underwear, and then weighing yourself afterwards and then noting what the percentage of body weight loss is and how much fluid you took in. Uh, within Fuel In, we do manage all that ourselves. Um, so all you have to do is put in those couple of figures, but there are some calculations out there or sheets out there that you could use online. Okay. Right. In terms of carb capacity testing, uh, what this refers to is the amount of car carbs that you can consume per hour. Okay. So it's really important that, again, you're logging what you're doing consistently over time. So often athletes will get to uh, the end of the day and or closer to a race and they'll be like, okay, I need to understand what my race plan is. And they often will pay someone uh, to go and write them a plan that is completely theoretical and based on just number of grams per hour that we know in the science is actually going to be beneficial. So if you look through the science now, somewhere between 90 to 120 grams an hour is probably going to be able to maximize your performance, but it may not be specific to you. So the way in which you do that is by logging the amount that you're consuming uh, session after session um, from bike to run and also brick. So in terms of the repetition and the reason we do this, there's the perception change from the gut and the brain. So the more full you are, the more that your brain can take in uh, how you're actually responding to it. And then in terms of the physiological change, what we're actually doing is changing the way in which the stomach empties quickly into the small intestine. And then also we're having the changes in terms of the transporters which actually transport the carbohydrate across the membrane uh, into the bloodstream and then into the muscle. And that takes time to change. When we look at research, they look at 10 consecutive training sessions to bring about these changes. However, for most people, you're not gonna be doing 10 high carbohydrate training sessions in a row. And therefore that could be only one session per week, which could be therefore 10 weeks of training your gut. Um, it is important, again, these are two screenshots that you can see on the left, um, the points that you may want to consider. So what were the, what did you consume? Was it solid carbohydrate? Was it fluid carbohydrate? What were the signs and symptoms? Did you have fullness? Did you have heaviness? Did you have any GI discomfort? On the right hand side is breaking it all down for you. So what is the average amount that you're consuming on a grams per hour basis? What's the total amount, including uh, fluids and solids? What's the peak amount at 92 grams an hour shown here? You can also break that down into grams per hour per kilogram. And 
Initially, what we might say for females, you'd be aiming for around 0.8 grams and around one gram per kilo body weight as a starting point. Beyond that, and once you've hit that, you certainly want to start working towards grams per hour. Um, and the rest of the screen, the screen shows how you can break it down into uh, whether it's solids or whether it's fluids that you are consuming. Okay, does anyone have any questions at this point in time? It's okay? Okay, so if we then look at uh, why athletes should not fear carbs, and I think there was a little bit of fear mongering uh, for a period of time. Uh, for a period of time, there was a little bit of fear mongering around carbohydrates and certainly the fear that carbohydrates will make you fat. Um, ultimately, no single macronutrient is going to make you fat. Uh, what makes you fat, if that is a concern, or what makes you put on weight is being in a caloric surplus, okay? When your calories are more than what your caloric expenditure is, then you are going to gain weight. The reverse of that can be said as well. If your caloric expenditure is higher than your caloric intake, then you will lose weight. Now, in terms of carbohydrates, carbohydrates are your primary fuel for high intensity efforts. So once you get beyond 60, 65% of your VO2 max, if that is known, then you are going to predominantly use carbohydrates as a fuel source. If you want to use heart rate, it's probably around 70, 75% of your heart rate max. So it's actually not that high when you start to partition less fat as a primary fuel source and then more carbohydrates. In terms of point number two, the high carbohydrate intake is being redefined. Traditionally, or probably 10 years ago, we saw numbers of around 60 grams an hour uh, that was reported in the literature as being the peak amount of carbohydrates that could be ingested and utilized by the body. That then changed when they found more transporters within the gut, okay, or within the small intestine that could transport a different type of carbohydrate. So initially it was glucose, and then they worked out that there was other transporters for another type of carbohydrate called fructose. So now you have what, are we, what we call multiple transportable carbs. That pushed up the amount to around 90 grams an hour. However, over the last sort of four to five years, that's been redefined again. And more recently in the research, we're seeing figures as high or carbohydrate oxidation figures as high as 140 grams per hour. And this is obviously resulting in increased performance um, as seen by several of the professional athletes and many, many age groupers at this time. Um, and then point number three, the reason you shouldn't fear carbs is, as I said, it is highly trainable. Even if you do experience GI issues and women will tend to experience more GI issues than men, it is trainable. You can bring up the amount of carbohydrates that you can consume and easily tolerate during a race by practicing it. It is a case of working out what products are suitable, uh, what types of carbohydrates are suitable, and then really just practicing that along the way. Okay, so if we get into some pre, uh, pre fueling nutrition, and this is obviously these are just figures that we're throwing out there, but certainly something practical for athletes to use. If the session is less than 60 minutes, regardless of what intensity it is, you can either do that session fasted, okay, not having eaten a meal beforehand, or you could have something very simple like a piece of toast maybe with some almond butter and jam or jelly, whichever you want to call it, depending on what country you're in. Um, but certainly you can consider doing these sessions faster. Now, despite what you might've heard on social media of late, fasted training will not kill you, okay? Certainly eating after a fasted session is recommended and is going to be beneficial. If the session is less than 60 minutes, depending on the preference of the athlete, you can do it without food, okay? whether you're a male or a female. When the session duration gets from over an hour, probably into around two and a half hours, and it's Z1, Z2, lower intensity session, then you certainly want to consider eating something beforehand. Now that's something lower carbohydrate, something around 30 grams of carbs. Now you may not want to eat eggs or anything like that beforehand. Certainly something like um, a piece of toast with some almond butter and jelly on it, will probably give you around 10 grams of protein, 30 grams of carbohydrates, and about five to eight grams of fat. That is pretty good. Now that's 
talking about pre-session fueling for a Z1, Z2. We're not talking about what's going to go during the sessions. And the session intensity creeps up. And certainly if it's for a bike session, again, between 60 and, and, and two and a half hours or 60 minutes and two, 120 minutes for a run, you'd certainly consider eating something a little bit more substantial. So around 50 grams of carbs. Something like overnight oats can be really effective. So overnight protein oats, where it could contain a slightly higher amount of protein, again, depending on your body size, anywhere from 20 to 40 grams of protein, 10 to 20 grams of fat, and certainly around 50 grams of carbohydrates. And that would be advisable. If you can't tolerate that due to GI issues, there are workarounds, something as simple as a couple of bits of toast, just doubling up what you had as the red meal could be a very effective strategy. And then certainly for runs over two hours and bikes over two and a half hours, regardless of the intensity, our advice would be that you should be consuming a decent amount of fuel. Once you get beyond about two to two and a half hours of continuous duration exercise, your ability to oxidize fat or use fat as a fuel source and also your ability to utilize carbohydrates as a fuel source is going to be maximized regardless of what you ate beforehand. So whether you think going into that session fasted at, and or eating before that session and actually eating during that session, once the extension of the uh, session gets beyond that sort of two, two and a half hours, you're going to be using everything that's on you anyway. And you're also going to be using anything that you're consuming. So that's a really important point to understand. Okay, then we get into in-session fueling. Okay, now depending on the duration of the session, certainly you're going to be thinking about, or and the intensity, you're going to be thinking about the type of fuel that you're using. So <clears throat> below the arrow, zones one, zone two, you're probably thinking, okay, if it's going beyond 60 minutes and you're going to have to continue exercising, probably somewhere around every 40 slash 60 minutes, you're going to look to consume a higher fat, lower carbohydrate product. Something like a picky bar or an almond butter pouch is very good. Uh, trail butter also um, produces a, a pretty good product. You can also eat whole foods. So you could, at this point in time, eat a handful of macadamias, some trail mix. Um, if you had your own sort of um, protein balls, which are, you know, moderate amount of fat and a moderate amount of carbohydrates, they could be consumed there. This is depicting what might be used if you were going to use these products in a race. My personal standpoint is that you don't use homemade products in races just because it's a bit of a faff and you don't know, um, you're obviously going to have to carry all that with you. It's sometimes much easier just to feel comfortable with products that you can purchase anywhere in the world or certainly uh, take with you in your hand luggage. Um, for zones three, five or anything above, you're certainly going to be considering taking on higher amounts of carbohydrates as mentioned before. These are a few products that we really like. Endurance Tap is a maple syrup uh, product made in Canada. It is fantastic. It's got a very high viscosity, so it goes down very, very easily. Precision uh, Fuel is excellent with 30 grams of carbs. And then you've got the Morton Gel, which is supplied on all Ironman courses. Cliff Blocks are very good. Um, some athletes like to use them on the run. Personally, I prefer to use them on the bike. They're just very easy. They can dissolve in the mouth if you don't like to chew as well. Um, again, depending on your ability to consume high amounts of carbohydrates, it's going to go from anywhere from 60 grams up to 120 grams an hour, depending on the intensity and your ability. Um, caffeine is something we probably won't touch on today. That's probably a whole other topic, but certainly carb uh, carbohydrates and caffeine combined can be very effective for racing. So if we look at the in-session fueling process, okay, it is important to consider like each of the three stages, especially if we're talking about uh, the longer duration events, which are like the 70.3 or the full, full distance. Um, you don't need to practice taking on a gel before every swim session, yet would certainly recommend doing it once or twice just to ensure you feel pretty good when you do it. It is advisable to take a gel probably somewhere between 10 and 20 minutes, 15, 20 minutes before a session. Um, the reason for this, you don't want to be taking it around 30 or 40 minutes before because there is a, a phenomenon called rebound hypoglycemia where you could get a sudden crash in blood sugars and feel very weak. Um, and it's not very nice for those who have experienced that before. Um, certainly practice this before you're going to do it. 
Uh, on race day, once you've got that dialed in, you have your gel or your blocks or your liquid cut. On the bike, it is going to be a preference of the athlete. Uh, blocks, gels, bars, liquid. Or um, 70.3 and even sprints, it's the belief that you can do this with gels, blocks or liquids. There won't really be a need for bars um, unless maybe duration is getting really extended. I am uh, along the line around every 60 minutes on the on the bike uh, can be very good in terms of just getting total calories in. For men, it's probably going to be around every 15 to 20 minutes, whereas for females, it's going to be around every 20 to 30 minutes. Now, that's just a generic rule um, that someone can try. Obviously, I've worked with females who do take in 100 to 120 grams an hour on the bike quite easily. Um, and they obviously are consuming that at a rate of every 15 minutes. The idea of taking in larger amounts of carbohydrates on the bike is to set yourself up for the run. So if you get off the bike and you're feeling fresh, then you're going to have a much better run. If you're getting off the bike and your glycogen uh, content in your muscles and your liver and your blood is, is already depleted, that run, especially for the mid distance and the, the full distance, is going to be very, very trying. Um, again, on the run, depending on the distance, 70.3, you're probably aiming for around somewhere between 50 and 90, 50 and 90 grams an hour. And uh, for females, maybe dropping it down a little bit, maybe more towards the 40, 60, uh, just depending on GI complaints. And then for the full distance, you're just trying to get in as much as you can tolerate and what you've practiced in training. And then post-session fueling. Obviously, there are some... some um, there are some cases where athletes are trying to manage their nutrition to improve body composition. Now, as I mentioned, improving body composition comes down to you being in a caloric deficit relative to your energy expenditure. Okay. Now that is a very important point for you to understand and also your coach to understand if you do have a coach, because your performance is probably going to suffer a little bit if you are in a caloric deficit. You don't have to be in a huge caloric deficit. So we're not talking about being like 800 calories a day. You just have to be in a, in, a, in a deficit in order to see some of that weight come off. But it is an important consideration and something to talk about with your coach, especially if it's in season and you're preparing for a race. If you are preparing for a race and there's limited time, my suggestion would be don't try and cut weight, focus on performance, focus on getting your energy in, and practicing fueling and hydration on the bike and the run and the, and the fueling around that. Um, this is obviously the way in which we structure it is a light, a, a traffic light system. So red would be 30 grams or less. Moderate would be yellow uh, of around 50 grams of carbs or, or around that mark. And then green is sort of your happy days and you're going to be taking in anywhere from 100 grams plus of carbohydrates. Mixed macronutrients are going to be taken into this. So your protein, fat, and, and your protein and fat is going to be factored in as well, um, where protein is probably for an endurance athlete, certainly no less than 1.6 grams per kilo body weight, uh, and certainly up to around 2.5 grams per kilo body weight. Uh, fat, as I'll show you, is going to be managed uh, probably in a moderate amount and then just lay it on depending on total training volume. So this is an Example is so you'll see something like 150 grams of 85 grams of fat, and that gives a total of days. Cool. Cool. 3, so it's not under 3,300 calories. And this is for a professional. Sorry, someone asking a question. No. So it's got yeah, okay. Simon. So this is this is. I don't know if it was the same for everyone else, but I, I um, maybe it was breaking up on my end only, but I couldn't really hear what you were saying on the first um, couple of sentences on this slide. Was that the same for anyone on this else? Slide. Yeah, same for me too. On okay. this slide. So you might yeah, you might want to start from the top on this slide again, Scott. You you broke up a little bit. Cool. Okay. So this slide is, is showing some examples from the actual app, okay? So at the top on the left is the athlete's uh, total macro summary. So this guy is actually a professional athlete. So he has, and he's also trying to gain weight 
um, recently on Instagram, he was kind enough to uh, post for us around his battles with actually um, disordered eating over the past three years and he making a fairly successful comeback over the last few months. Um, okay. And someone's drawing on the screen. I'm not sure how they're doing that. Um, so this is a... Bike ride on the right hand side where it is fairly extensive. It's 230 minutes, okay? Um, it is dictated as actually a Z3 session because he actually wants to practice higher carb fueling. So he's having a snack beforehand. So if he was to tap that green snack one button, it would bring up a number of options where he can consume. In this case, he's consuming overnight oats with fruit salad, a couple of boiled eggs, and a couple of pieces of white toast. So there's a lot to eat before going and doing that session. During that session, he's been recommended a target of 90 to 120 grams of carbs per hour, plus or minus 10 grams of fat. So the way in which he'll do this is through either three blocks or one gel every 15 to 20 minutes with the option to do one bar every 60 minutes, okay? So he is not being shy with in-session fueling. He's now easily at the capacity of around 120 grams an hour. He is actually shooting just above that at about 140 grams an hour. Um, and that will probably be the threshold for where he goes. Um, after that, you can see on the left-hand screen that he's being um, asked to refuel following that bike session. So post-bike session is, again, a green breakfast. And again, he would be given information about what he needs to consume in there. He can tap on that, and that will give him, again, more options to have. He's then being told to have a snack, so a yellow snack pre-strength. And then he has his strength session built in. And then post that, he has, again, a meal, uh, which is a green lunch. So the way in which the system works is that he just sees a color and he knows, okay, it's either high carbohydrate, moderate amounts of carbohydrate, or lower amounts of carbohydrate. Uh, in terms of high carb, I think the, the key takeaways from this point in time is that for me, higher carbohydrates is going to result in higher performance, okay? Um, I think it's pretty clear and a pretty – I don't think anyone can dispute that the literature supports that higher performance is based on higher carbohydrate consumption. Yes, there can be cases where higher fat, lower carb intake during particular parts of the season could be advantageous, but when we're talking about – practicing and racing with high performance, then carbohydrates are certainly going to be your best friend. Um, there is an important distinction between eating your carbohydrates and drinking your carbs. If you are someone who suffers from a lot of GI complaints with the longer distance racing, then the suggestion would certainly be to probably pull back on the highly concentrated carb drinks and start to practice eating your carbs a little bit more. The other point is that your gut is trainable. As mentioned, Physiologically and psychologically, you can change the perception and the actual inner workings of the gut, and that can make it extremely beneficial for athletes to perform at their, at their best. In terms of your daily nutrition, I think the really important things here is focus on your purpose. Are you trying to lose or improve your body composition, i.e. lose body fat and lose weight, or are you trying to perform at your best? You cannot, or you can, but it is extremely difficult to try and do both at the same time, okay? Pick your points in the season when you want to try and attack improving body composition versus when you're trying to perform at your best. Fuel for the work required is a term coined by uh, James Morton and his team at, um, at uh, uh, Liverpool University. They wrote a seminal paper on that where a lot of our uh, information is based on. So that means if you're doing high intensity work, fuel it with carbohydrates, okay? And then probably the other thing to be really mindful of is planning ahead. Understand that on a Friday, you may have only half an hour or 50 minutes of a swim session, but the following day you have a three hour brick, then you certainly wanna be thinking about eating higher amounts of carbohydrates and certainly higher amounts of calories on that Friday, despite only having say a very short training day. Thinking 24 hours ahead is certainly the least you can do to improve your performance. 
Okay. Um, in terms of, we'll get into some questions after this, but in terms of um, what is Fuelin? Fuelin, as I said, is the world's first uh, training-based nutrition app. So it syncs directly with Training Peaks Today's Plan and Final Surge. Um, so what you do is authorize us to have a connection via API uh, into your account, and then we do the rest. So it makes things very simple. Okay. So we remove a lot of that decision paralysis around how much to eat and what types of accounts of protein and fat to eat. Um, it uses this intuitive traffic light system. Once you get used to seeing the colors, you know exactly what types of foods you should be eating. Um, and as I said, it eliminates that guesswork. It is highly specific and personalized to you. So depending on your training volume, your training intensity, um, and what your coach is giving you, the program will adapt to you. It is purpose-driven. So if you are trying to lose weight, then you will be pushed into a caloric deficit, which is relative to week on week training volume. Um, if you are in high performance mode though, certainly we won't be giving you uh, a shortage of calories and we'll be maximizing your performance. It is very focused on health and performance. So things like the blood tests uh, are some of, the, some of the markers that we do insist athletes get to make sure that you are actually healthy. And by implementing a strategic training-based nutrition plan, we should see improvements in those health markers as well. And then from a results perspective, we are very data focused, which a lot of triathletes are. Um, so we, you can collect a lot of information around your sweat rate and improve your hydration plan. You can uh, plan out your carbohydrate capacity and that's uh, often every athlete loves that. And then I think the other thing uh, is that we're constantly improving the app based on integrations uh, with other items and wearables and things like that are coming, be going to become part of the fuel in program in 2023. Okay, so the system works by obviously signing up and downloading fuel in, and then you just have to sync your plan, train and eat. And it's really that simple. It's about measuring progress. So if you want to track your macros, you can, it does sync with my fitness pal and lose it. And there is also an extensive list within, uh, within the recipe section. Um, and you can also track your body weight if it is something that you want to do. We usually recommend that's done on a Monday and a Friday morning. And then what we also do is have weekly Q&A sessions. So every Friday, uh, we do a one-hour session on performance nutrition based on the latest research and what athletes are requesting. Um, we will be looking to do, depending on how athletes find this session, um, and integrating more with the Ringer Tri Club and doing more of these edu educational sessions for them as well. Um, in terms of the, the program initially was set up and it was quite expensive uh, just because we actually wanted to hold back on numbers of athletes sort of joining. But more recently, we have set up a program which is called the pilot program, which is $29 a month uh, if you do it on an annual basis. If it is just a month on month basis, it is $39 a month. And that is actually in US dollars. But what we'll do for Ringa Tri Club is bring that down. So it's uh, the equivalent in Aussie dollars. Um, for any members that are uh, we're in the tri club members. Okay, uh, questions. Sorry about that. I had a lot of uh, technical issues here. I'm not quite sure what was happening, but uh, I will answer any questions you might have now. I haven't got a question, but Alex Gooch apologizes for scribbling all over your screen. She's had to how drop you, off. How do you, how do you do? How did she do that? She was on her phone and she was multitasking with something with work and then she managed to scribble on it and then she couldn't take herself off mute to apologise. So she's asked me to do that for her. I, I couldn't work out how she did it. I was like, wow, that's amazing. Um, I just want to show you this screen actually because this is a more updated screen as well. So what you can see here on the left is now what we're actually providing is the individual macros uh, for each actual meal, not just the carbohydrate colour. So athletes, so this is actually from my plan. Um, so breakfast, I'm getting told to have around 50 grams of protein, 25 grams of fat and 100 grams of carbs. Okay, and that's for my Sunday session coming up. I've got a fairly long brick coming up, so um, it's not gonna be fun. But as you can see then on the next screen along, uh, it's telling me when to have it. Uh, and then it's also telling me what I should be consuming during that session and so on. So that is, a, that is an updated screen that we just uh, released a week and a half ago and athletes have been thoroughly enjoying that. Okay. Right. 
Uh, questions? Yeah, I'll oh. jump in. Yeah, sorry. Um, for you, you may have mentioned it, but and I may have missed it. But in terms of when before an event, you should start. Yeah, the, the pre nutrition side of things. Uh, was that night before, morning of, bit of both? Do you mean in terms of carbohydrate loading? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Loading, um, I've read a few articles on this, but um, yeah, generally speaking, at least probably 24 to 36 hours before. Um, some athletes will go 48 hours, with, um, up to 48 hours beforehand. It's certainly not important to do it for a full week. Uh, that's sort of outdated, outdated science. You don't have to do glycogen depleting exercise prior either. Um, Certainly what I would recommend, though, is not doing it based on a percentage of calories. So, again, traditionally where it's failed in research to show positive effects is when athletes have consumed, say, 60% of their total caloric intake. Now, if your total caloric intake is very low, say 2,000 calories, then 60% may not be the amount of carbohydrates required to get you up to, uh, to fully load up sort of your liver, your muscles and whatnot. So instead of that, you're better off going by grams per kilogram basis. So for females especially, they should be looking at a minimum of eight grams per kilo body weight for carbohydrate loading. For men, I'd probably just for simplicity say the same. Um, there is a little bit of research to show that men can benefit from less than eight, eight grams per kilo body weight. But certainly I think just to keep it simple, aim for a minimum of eight grams per kilo body weight if you are going to do a carbohydrate load. Um, you also want to keep in mind that you want to practice that. Do not do that for the first time before a race, because if you've ever eaten eight grams per kilo of body weight or um, of carbohydrates, it's a lot. Okay. Um, you know, that's six, nearly 700 grams of carbs for me. Now that's 700 grams of carbs. That's not net cut. That's not like the weight of the carbohydrates. In order to get that, you're probably going to have to eat about 1.3 kilos of food, okay, of high glycemic index food. So probably thinking lots of bread, rice, pasta. You're also minimizing the amount of fiber that you're taking in as well. So you ideally want to try and keep fiber intake down to around 10 to maybe 15 grams in that day, probably a little bit less. And over the course of that week, probably gradually reduce fiber intake as well because that's been shown to improve GI complaints. And any opinions on refined versus unrefined carbs? Mate, it's glucose. When you break it all down, it's glucose. And this is where like talking about good versus bad in carbohydrate world, it just doesn't exist in high performance. You are, you are going to be smashing that much, unref that much refined and processed foods. It is not healthy, like 100%. I, if you want to talk healthy, unhealthy, you're fueling for a purpose. Yeah. And if you try and like, if you tried to eat eight grams of whole foods um, in those loading days and do that purely through fibrous vegetables, A, you will be so full of fiber that you won't be able to do anything and you'll probably won't even get off the toilet the next day, but you'll just struggle to eat that amount. So you're probably going to have to rely on processed and ultra processed foods to actually get that amount in. And it's fueling for a purpose, okay? And it's fueling for the work required. And that's, it is always the conundrum here. I'm not saying you have to do that all the time. Certainly for practicing, when you're specifically practicing carbohydrate loading, you want to practice what you plan on doing before a race. But you can still, you know, for that five grams, maybe six grams, you could still eat, you know, high glycemic uh, vegetables, say potatoes, white potatoes, sweet potato, things like that. Uh, in order to get that up, maybe some whole grain breads, uh, some whole grain pastas. You still could do that in other days, which demand higher amounts of carb, but maybe not specific to what you know you're doing for race day. Cool. All right. Excellent. Thank yeah. you. Cool. Uh, I had a question. Um, okay. What's your position on salt tablets intakes in long distance racing? Yeah. So sodiums. Um, Sodium is really interesting. Uh, I, so Dr. Alan McCubbin and I did a YouTube video on this, um, covering it. It goes for about an hour and a half, so apologies. Uh, it is fairly extensive, though. So there is a lot of, well, there's probably, there is science relating to uh, sodium intake and fluid balance. 
it is still not 100% conclusive, okay? So whilst there is data related to sodium intake and those individuals that may require some sodium, there are always going to be the anomaly and the athlete out there that requires higher amounts of sodium. So as a general rule for fluid loss, okay, based on your fluid loss, you should be consuming, again, depending on the duration of the session, um, around 60 to 70% of that fluid loss. And again, if you go in your sodium, uh, sweat sodium uh, measure or measured, then you should be taking somewhere probably between 40 and 50% of that loss. Keeping in mind that you're always going to be replacing some sodium through habitual diet. So I think what's really important here, Graham, is that you're not like if you, has anyone done the precision hydration sweat sodium test? Has anyone done that or CODA, anything like that? Do you know about them? No. Okay. So yeah. I'll, I'll introduce you to um, precision as well, Simon, so you can do it. it. It's a cool test. Like it's, it's site specific, but it will give you an indication of what uh, sweat sodium content you have. So whether you're yeah. very low or whether you're very high, and it's a way of managing, sort of giving you again a guardrail of how much sodium you may require um, leading into a race and then certainly during the race. Um, if, you're, if you don't get that test done, then probably a very simple way of thinking about it, unless you're covered in white stuff at the end of say training sessions, you're probably a low to moderate sodium sweater. And therefore you could take in somewhere between 300 and 600 milligrams per liter of sodium. Does that answer your question, Greg? A bit more understanding, yep. Yeah. Do you Thanks. take in sodium pills? Uh I used to, in some of the races, take in some of the tablets, but I didn't find they sat well in my stomach. Uh, I was better off in through some other sorts. I, you're just breaking out. I don't know if it's me or, um, or you. Okay, that's all right. Um, yeah. I think you said you, you have uh, some, some GI complaints when you have those. Yeah, look, the important things with any salt capsules as well or sodium is that carbohydrates are required in order to transport the sodium across the intestinal membrane. So taking salt on its own without any carbohydrate um, certainly could, be, could have negative consequences on you if you're not consuming some carbohydrates with it. It only needs to be about three to five grams. Um, and certainly if you're ingesting fluids and gels and blocks at the same time, then it should cover it. Okay. Thank you. Cool. Uh, any other questions? Karen or Max, do you have any questions? Is everyone racing uh, middle distance, sort of 70.3 or Ironman, or what's everyone doing? And doing Iron Man. Doing Iron Man. Which one? Port Port Mac. Uh, Port Macquarie. Okay. Oh, I'll I'll cheer you on at the end. Hopefully I'll finish before you. Wear your pajamas. <laughs> I'll be late. <laughs> yeah. So I mean, look, in your case, Graham, like, you know, depending on speed and duration, then it, it becomes a calorie gain as well. Like, you know you're going to be using, you know, maximal amounts of body fat and maximal amounts of stored glycogen. And then you're going to be using what we call exogenous fuel. So the fuel that you're taking in and you just need to manage that appropriately. And that's, if it is going to be a long time, then certainly some mixed fuel, um, occasionally having something that is not super sweet is certainly going to be advantageous to you. So consider that when you are out on the course for that duration. Um, Simon, do you have any questions? Uh, I'm, I, <laughs> I'm, I'm, well, first of all, thanks, Scott. That's really helpful. It's, uh, it's certainly increased my knowledge, which, which wasn't a high bar in fairness, but I, uh, I know a lot more now than I did before. But I was, uh, I was entertained by your comments about people trying to cut weight. And, uh, 
Hands up. I, I didn't think anyone else did that. <laughs> Trying to cut weight. Yeah, yeah. So just uh, in, in, in full disclosure, you know, when I've done sprint races or uh, Olympic races, I, I purposely uh, dialed down the nutrition because uh, I quite like losing the weight, you know, and I'm, I'm training for those races. Now, it's a trade off because, you know, I don't mind if I'm a little bit slow, maybe on Olympic. But then when you step up to half Ironman and full Ironman, then I take it a lot more seriously. So I guess my question is, is that common? Do you, do you see some people really trying to cut weight through withholding the fueling on their training? And do people only do that up to a certain distance? Yeah, I, look, it was, it's one of those unexpected things. So there's about, we have about 500, just over 500 uh, monthly users on the fueling app. And I would say probably 95% of them put a target weight below what their actual weight is at this point in time. So whether it's subconscious or not, I think majority of triathletes are in the sport trying to lose a little bit of weight. And that comes back to, I don't think necessarily all of them need to lose weight though. And that comes back to things like the DEXA scan. So you will see athletes on course. Like, I mean, I was in Kona last year. I think we had 58 athletes on racing. Now that's meant to be the health, the pinnacle of health uh for the sport and i can tell you now there were plenty of unhealthy looking people out there um it's you know being super lean and, and thin is not necessarily healthy and so i mean you, you've only got to look at the increasing number of um you know athletes with stress fractures especially professional athletes not just female but coming out on instagram now um and sharing that i mean alistair brownley had a femoral stress fracture He's still in the Olympic, isn't he? So it's, it's not just something where, you know, you can say I'm only doing sprints or I'm only doing Olympics and therefore I don't need to eat because it can have dire consequences. You can still suffer from low energy availability or LEA and what we call REDS, which is a relative energy, uh, relative energy deficiency in sport. Now with those comes... If you do it in the short term, you'll probably get away with it. You'll come away with like, you know, probably a reduction in body fat and whatnot. But over a period of time, it doesn't have to be too long. It can be as low as two weeks. You can start to see these physiological changes occur. Okay. So you get, even in the acute setting, not eating after training can have a negative impact on bone mineral markers. Okay. So within a few hours in the acute setting, uh, say a female, in particular females, uh, decides not to eat after a training session, then you'll have an increased rate of bone absorption and a reduction in the bone being laid down. Now you do that repetitively over time, maybe two weeks, maybe four weeks, it could have dire consequences on the health of the bone. So it's, you know, there are, there are a lot of consequences of underfueling, um, and it is male and female. And unfortunately I think we see it too often in the sport, not, not just, not just triathlon, but probably endurance sports in general. And yeah. I think what's been really good about the Norwegians and the publicity that they've received is that they focus on fueling and they're focusing on high performance fueling. And that's certainly what we want to do as well. Like we get it. Some athletes will want to cut weight, okay, and lose weight, but you can do it in a sensible manner. You don't need to be doing 500 calories a day and then training for three hours, which athletes do. You know, if you get if you get your protein way up, like majority of athletes, again, come back to baselines and things like that, but majority of endurance athletes will be under consuming protein probably by about 50 to anywhere from 40 to 60 percent. Mm. Um, and the only way you know that is by tracking. So, you know, you should probably be doing something like. Um, you know, keeping a food diary and just seeing actually what you are consuming on a daily basis. And that will start to give you an inkling of, you know, where maybe you sit in, in the whole realm, realm of, you know, are you providing yourself with enough energy? Hmm. There's, there's a good segue yeah. there. Um, we've got another question come up in the chat. I don't know if you noticed from um, Sidant. Oh, who's asking? Because uh, I think he's got. Uh, Sorry, I didn't get that. Um, no, no, that's all good. Um, so when you uh, when you talk about post workout nutrition, do you provide? I presume he's talking about the app here. Do you provide guidance for the meal that one consumes immediately post the workout, and or how one should be fueling through the remaining part of the day? 
Yeah, so the way it works is that we'll give you guidance. Um, as I showed, the, the carb color will come up after that. So we'll give you an indication of like uh, the amount of carbohydrate you need. Now, red is generally associated more with salads and lots of vegetables. Uh, then a yellow meal would be something like a lot of vegetables and salad, but probably layered on with some extra glycemic index uh, foods. So things like whether it be some rice, some uh, whole grains, uh, some root vegetables, some bread, pasta, whatever makes up that uh, remainder of carbohydrate. And then green, generally when you see green, you're probably going to still, we still try and consume at least six fifths of veggies a day, um, six servings of vegetables a day, because from a health perspective, we know that that's going to be very important. Um, and we do have this push for health. But then certainly when you see green, just from a physical standpoint, back to what we're talking about with Rowan, is that you're probably going to have to consume, you know, some foods, things like potatoes, certainly um, sweet potato, potatoes, maybe some rice, pasta, whole grains, maybe some bread, just to get that total amount of carbohydrates up. Um, and as I also showed, the release last week was that now you also understand the amount of protein and the amount of fat in each of those meals. And pretty quickly, you start to work out what meals associate with that. So we do provide meal recommendations. Uh, which things like overnight protein notes, eggs, it doesn't have to be complicated. I think a lot of people think they've got to be Jamie Oliver every day. And the reality is like, if I've got a red snack, it's a piece of toast with probably some almond butter and some jam on it. If it's a yellow snack before a longer session, I probably just have two. Okay. It's that simple. And then, you know, post, I always eat overnight protein oats. I just have it. It's a cup of oats. It's got 40 grams of whey protein in it. It's got two Brazil nuts. It's got half a scoop of chia nuts. It's got some milk and some Greek yogurt. It gives me around 55 grams of carbs. It gives me 40 grams of protein and 15 grams of fat. I've sort of built that out. I know what it is. I just go into automatic pilot when I'm doing it now because I built that recipe and then I do it. So again, like we can't tell you exactly what you're going to need to eat on that day because I don't know what's in your fridge. Hence why we give you uh, a color coding system as opposed to the specific meals. We can give you suggestions, but we can't tell you to eat fish on a Friday or chicken on a Tuesday, because if you don't have it there in your fridge on those days, then what happens? You freak out and you're like, oh, I can't do this anymore. Whereas if it's in your hands and you understand the principles around it, then you can do whatever you want. Like you can look in there and go, oh God, I've only got a two cans of uh, you know, sliced salmon and I've got some rocket in the fridge and uh, a couple of tomatoes and whatever else. I've got some couscous, packet of couscous. Okay, I can make a dinner here that will at least get me through to get me there. And that, that's probably the biggest point here is that it's not a standard sort of PDF that is inflexible and not malleable to what your actual training program is. It does move based on what you're doing. Cool. Got a question coming from Karen. Uh, and Karen, yes, the recording is going to be available to anyone who registered for, for today's event. Uh, so we're going to share the recording. Uh, I don't know how soon that's going to come out, Scott, but over the next 24 hours. Or so. Yeah, pretty pretty quickly. We'll get it out. I'm sorry about the start. I was having all sorts of, I don't know, there was weird noises going on here. It was really throwing me. So um, I know I threw out a lot of numbers and uh, figures and things like that at the start. So um I know it can be a bit overwhelming and I think probably the biggest point about this is what we're doing is trying to remove all that decision paralysis for you so that at least there's a framework there for you to work off and then gradually you understand and learn what you need because it takes, it takes a lot to understand it and it takes a lot for you to be able to plan ahead um, and from my own personal experience, like training for an I or a half Ironman or an Ironman takes a lot of time, obviously. Um, but if I didn't have like a – and what your co – does everyone have coaches, by the way, or training plans? Does everyone have a training plan? Yeah, okay. How do you train, Rowan? I'm always fascinated by how athletes train without a training plan. You're on mute. I, I do have a vague training plan. When you started, yeah, I was saying no to the one before training plan. Oh, cool. Okay. Uh, so, yeah, I like your co 
<clears throat> your coach will give you a structured training plan. What we're giving you is a structured nutrition plan. And when you give them together, it just really empowers you. And honestly, I don't actually know what I would be doing if I didn't have the nutrition plan to assist me with the coach's training plan. Like I honestly would just be eating so much. That's the other thing is what's really interesting is endurance exercise drives up hunger a lot because you sit on this bike for hours and hours and you go and do these low intensity runs. It is surprising sometimes like the amount of energy you need relative to what your purpose is and what and that's, it can also go very wrong and i'm sure you've seen this in the past or maybe from friends is that maybe they're doing this training and they're like i don't get it i'm putting on weight but i'm still spending like you know i'm doing 12 hours of training a week so it is about energy balance and making sure that you are taking in not just you know we certainly don't want you going into a caloric deficit or extreme caloric deficit but certainly we don't want you overeating and therefore becoming unhealthy due to unnecessary fat gain as well. So it is, there is a very fine balance there. And I think it, it is a very gray area. Um, it's certainly not like black and white. You need to eat before every session or no, you don't need to eat before every session. There are a lot of factors that come into it. Cool. Um, you can reach out. Uh, Simon will share details as well of um, uh, email address. You can reach me at scott at fuelin.com. If you want, you can certainly go on the website. Um, Simon will share a um, that code just to bring. Uh, we've just got to work out how to factor that in. So bring the, the cost down to Aussie dollars uh, for Warringah Tri Club members. And uh, I know we're talking about uh, sponsorship and all that sort of stuff in uh, the future as well. So, uh, look, uh, hopefully uh, those who joined uh, enjoyed it. I'm sure it will hopefully it uh, sort of piqued the interest and uh, sort of maybe made you aware of maybe some things that you you are doing, you're doing very well or maybe not doing quite so well and maybe some areas you can improve. In. Okay. Thank you. Well, I know it's Monday night. So, and Graham, how many have you done? How many I'm in? I bet you've done like 15 or something. 30. 30. Wow. That's amazing. <laughs> that is amazing. I think you can teach me. Oh, God, no. <laughs> you, you can teach us what you're eating and what you're doing. I, I'm amazed when anyone says they've done more than like three. But uh, 30 is incredible. So, hats off to you, mate. That's incredible. Yeah. So, very, very well played. Um, Okay, well, look, I know it's Monday evening, so yeah. we'll, we'll say goodbye and, uh, yeah, hopefully hear from a few later. Scott, thanks, thanks so much. That Thank was you. a great question. Really helpful, mate. Appreciate it. Okay, perfect. Thanks, Simon, so, as well. Thanks, everyone. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye -bye. Thank you.